Hey, and welcome back to The Family Records. Six times a week, we pull a random record out of my collection and explore the stories of the music and the musicians. Today's musician is described in his Rock and Roll Hall of Fame biography as, quote, arguably the greatest instrumentalist in the history of rock music. When he died in 1970 at the age of 27, people described it as the end of the new era of rock. He pointed the way to where guitar was going. The legacy he left after his death was matched only by a public desire to hear more of his music. And so, the unreleased songs he left behind became a very valuable commodity. So valuable that today's album was the third posthumous release of mostly unreleased material, coming out only 25 months after he passed. Let's drop the needle on. Jimi Hendrix, War Heroes. Jimi Hendrix left an indelible mark on the face of music. While he was alive, he was actively making music for eight years, releasing four albums in that time and becoming the world's highest paid rock musician. One year before his death, he headlined the Woodstock Music and Art Fair that included many of the most popular bands of the time. During his performance, he played a rendition of the Star Spangled Banner with copious feedback, distortion, and sustain to imitate the sounds made by rockets and bombs. This performance is still discussed to this day. In 1967, Hendrix was gaining mass popularity and the suits could smell money. Many of his pre-experience recordings were marketed to an unsuspecting public as Jimi Hendrix albums. The recordings were controlled by a producer at a company called PPX, whom Hendrix had signed a contract with in 1965. These recordings were often remixed between their repeated reissues, with Hendrix referring to the unauthorized releases as, quote, malicious and greatly inferior. Speaking at greater length about the problem, Hendrix said, at PPX, we spent on average about one hour recording a song. Today, I spent at least 12 hours on each song. Despite the criticism, these unauthorized releases were plentiful and widely distributed, making up a substantial part of the publicly available Hendrix catalog, totaling hundreds of releases. On September 18th, 1970, Jimi Hendrix passed away in London. 27 years old, he had only begun on his journey of life and had already accomplished more than many of us could ever dream. Before his death, he had been working on his fourth studio album with enough material for a double record. Hendrix had even begun to organize a track list. However, only six songs were nearing completion with about 20 more in different stages of production. Much of this material was taken, broken up, remixed, and re-recorded on many, many posthumous releases. For over four decades after his death, the rights to this material were a battleground. Four years after Jimmy passed, his father, Al, had sold the distribution rights to a foreign corporation, but stated that it did not include copyrights and argued that he had retained veto power of the sale of the catalog. This argument delayed a multi-million dollar sale by RCA in 1993 of the Hendrix publishing copyrights because Al was unhappy about the arrangement. Under a settlement reached in July 1995, Al Hendricks regained control of his son's song and image rights, and this timing lined up with the creation of the family-run company Experience Hendrix LLC, which would handle the licensing of these song rights from now on. In 2010, they launched the Jimi Hendrix Catalog Project, starting with the release of Valleys of Neptune in March of that year. The LLC also has possession of a concept album Jimi was working on before his death, tentatively titled Black Gold. This album has never been released. Outside of the legitimate releases of his work, posthumously many gray and bootleg albums have released. Many of these have been reissued several times with different album names, packaging, and song titles. Some releases purporting to feature Hendrix as a sideman have been shown to be fake. The demand for these gray market bootlegs was so high that in 1998, Dagger Records was established to issue quote, official bootlegs of albums that don't meet the technical recording criteria and standards for mainstream release. These have included live recordings from various points in Jimmy's career, as well as demo and rehearsal recordings. War Heroes was released in October 1972. It was the sixth release of Hendrix material since he passed, three of those being studio albums and three of those being live recording albums. It reached number 23 in the UK, number 48 on the US Billboard 200, and number 51 in Canada. 
25 months after his death, Jimi Hendrix was still charting and still influencing the world of music. An incredible career cut too short. He lives on now and forever through his sound. Rest in peace. And thanks for watching with the family. If you liked this video, feel free to drop us a like. It lets us show you more of these records and show them to more people. If you're new here, new to the family, hit that subscribe button, ring the bell, you'll never miss an album. We will put them out six times a week, so you don't want to miss one. And with all that said, you can uh, stay tuned now for my unedited thoughts. Just gonna talk a little bit about Hendrix, a little bit about the process of making this video and uh, all that good stuff. Uh, if not, I'll see you tomorrow for the next album. Make sure to like, sub, ring the bell, leave your comments. Appreciate you guys, love you. Have a blessed weekend and I will see you tomorrow with another album. Bye. So, War Heroes by Jimi Hendrix. This was supposed to come out on Tuesday and uh, I just had massive technical issues that day and recorded these stand-ups that I'm doing right now about four or five different times and they were just all garbage. Uh, not because of my performance, which was excellent obviously, but technical issues just messed up the whole day. So I was really disappointed not to get an album out that day. Um, the YouTube numbers look like YouTube was really disappointed in me for not doing it, so that sucks. But, um, you know, we do what we can, and I'm here now. Uh, we've got the album in the bag. I remembered to flip around the album today, which is great, because I actually recorded the take of it without, and then I realized, well, I gotta fix a couple things anyway, so I did another take with the album flipped. Excellent. But, uh, yeah, otherwise, this was a good album, from what I remember listening to it on Tuesday. Uh, Jimmy's just always good. Like, the guitar is great, and there's some good songs on there. But there's also kind of some songs that it feels like studio fucking around a little bit like just he's having fun and I don't know if these were ever actually going to be part of any album or or maybe they were but something something different thematically more you know we'll never know uh, ultimately we'll never know but yeah there is definitely some interesting tracks on it um there's one that I remember him singing about like mama bear and papa bear and that's what I'm thinking of but just like really unusual kind of stuff for him at least of my knowledge of Hendrix which is not great to be fair but uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, when I was listening to this album and kind of reflecting on the whole situation there, definitely, it just made me think, you know, this is obviously why we do these things. Like, this is why creative people create, because you want to speak to someone and have your feelings and ideas connect to someone else in a real way. But... There's also, whenever you make anything, there's also a fear of showing it because you're afraid, will it get rejected? Will people like this? Will I be a laughing stock? Will I be uh, a joke? And so, you know, I think once you achieve a certain level of success, some of that goes away. It, I don't think it ever truly does, but some of that does go away. But then there's also the concern of what happens to the things you created once you're gone. And that is very difficult. There's no way, maybe contractually, maybe there is some way, maybe people are, are doing this now because they've seen this too many times, but it seems to me you just have to hope that you leave behind a good community that cares about the quality of the work that you've distributed and produced so that they will hold anything released posthumously to a high level. And then also that you've created sort of like um, a business community, whether that's your, your family, uh, people that you work with, etc. You've created the community of people who are also invested in your creations and the things that you produce and will be there once you're gone to make sure that the quality or the level of release it matches a standard that you would have approved of. And, and again, this is all speculative, right? I mean, all your family can do is, is hope that they're, or all these people who you've left behind can do is hope that they're doing the best for what you would have wanted. And it's very difficult, right? I mean, you, you never know. And I, I think we talked about this before, but obviously there's the evolution of the creative too. So something that you might have been 
good with when you're 27. Maybe if you'd lived another 10 years, you would feel very differently about. So it's this weird snapshot of a person also when they die so young, where you don't fully get to see that evolution and you don't get to see how they will progress their ideas and how they will take what they've learned and, and the experiences that they've gained and pour those back into their art. And I think that's a really important thing. And I think that it's really unfortunate that so many of these artists die really young and we never get to see that. Something that I always talk about is how unfortunate it is that the world that we live in just defines your ability to do something with your life based on so many random variables. Uh, one of the main ones being where you're born and a subset of that being you know, what your ethnicity is, what you look like. But I think a big part, a, the bigger part for sure is, is where you're born in terms of, I always think about how many amazing, brilliant minds we must have lost because they were born in the country with a war going on. They were born in the country that we've decided is a third world country. And so we don't care if, if children starve to death. You know, it just feels like there's such a disservice being done to the species where every person who's born, every new life is a massive potential for so many things. And you see this so much these days with, because things are so fucked, <laughs> you see these younger kids doing crazy things because they realize, hey, I don't have time to grow up and have a normal life. I need to do this now so that there is a potential that I can grow up and have a normal life, which is terrible and also extremely, it's, it's inspiring and it's also empowering in a way because I think it really does speak to the idea that there is no age that you can do things at and there's never a time where you've gotten too old to help change the world and there's never a time where you're too young to help change the world. But going back to my main thought on that, I just think that one of the biggest problems that we have as a species is that we've decided that if you get born in America, great. And if you're a genius, that's excellent. And you'll get to change the world. But if you're born in Syria, um, just as an example, I'm going to use Syria. I was actually thinking of Yemen, um, but or Palestine. Let's say Palestine. You get you're born in Palestine and you're a genius level IQ. But since you live in Palestine, you get shot by Israeli security, or you starve to death, or you can't get water because lands that used to have access to water have been subjugated from you. And, and not to do an Israel tangent here, this is just a general thought about what a great disservice we're doing to ourselves as a species by letting these kids die and, you know, wasting so much human potential. So anyway, <laughs> that was a long tangent to say that it's super unfortunate that people die before the brilliance within them is allowed to be expressed and that we as a species and a society lose so much by losing these people. So it's a, it's a tragedy, and definitely this story is a tragedy um, overall. I think, again, it just speaks to that idea of business interests not having creative capacity and not understanding, and, and, and the reverse, right? Where, you know, creative people, we have to do this dance with money because you need it to survive. And... If you are in a position where you get paid for your creativity, you're already extremely lucky. But then even within that, there's a whole bunch of issues that come up. And, you know, again, great, we, when we talk about the Eagles, another great example where the Eagles were a massive hit band and their label just put out a record and they were pissed about it. And that record was a huge hit and obviously made them a lot of money. So they were able to keep, and you know, like I said, they, they, they took a glass half full and they said, we're going to focus on Hotel California and the money from this is going to let us do more with that. And that's great. But it does show you that no matter what level you get to, there's always that friction between pure creative spirit and capitalism. And I think, you know, I think you look at the world and I think that um, we're in the dusk, the sunset of capitalism. Uh, I just think it's, not that 
a capital-based society will necessarily disappear, but there are so many innovations that are happening so quickly that we will not be able to maintain the current type of capitalism that we have where uh, you go to school, you become a program drone so that you're good to go to an office and not question why you're wasting your life eight hours plus a day for a decent salary. And really, the more that time goes on, the more that that stops being true too. But anyway, um, yeah, I, like I said, I've said before, I'm sure this won't be the last time that we speak on the, the conflict between money and creativity. And certainly this won't be the last time, I'm sure, that we'll find an artist who's died and whose work is being handled posthumously, perhaps in a way that they would not approve of. And that's just the way it is. But yeah, uh, excellent album, an incredible musician, died way too young. Um, I'm very hopeful to pull some more of his records, his real records out of the, his real records, his uh, pre-death records out of the collection and give them a listen because I'm a big fan of Hendrix. So love this album. Uh, again, sorry it took so long to get this review up. I will be putting this one up today. Uh, so my plan is, this one is definitely going to be 6 o'clock today. And then hopefully I'll have the other one at 6 o'clock too. But it's possible that uh, doing both of them is going to delay me a little bit. So for sure, one of the two albums at 6. And then the other one shortly after, let's say by 9. Give myself another three hours there. So by 9, you'll have two albums today, starting with this one. And... Uh, and then, yeah, and then everything's the same. So tomorrow we'll have the two shorts again for the two albums, this one and the one that I'm going to do coming up. And, um, and then, yeah, then we're back to a regularly scheduled Sunday one album and then get the short for that on Monday. And then on Monday, we just start all over again, six more records. That'll be our fifth week. I got some more content planned. I kind of slowed down a bit this week, just uh, a little bit of um, burnout-ish. I wouldn't really call it burnout, but just more... Um, a bunch of things, <laughs> a bunch of things coming up, and me trying to juggle my time between all of them. But uh, we're staying consistent. We're doing these records six times a week, uh, and you never know what we're gonna pull out next. So lots of classics so far, and there's still like a thousand records to go. So stay tuned. If you're not part of the family, hit that subscribe button. It's a great time to join in. And if you know someone who would like this kind of content and they're not part of the family yet, throw them a link. Let them see what we got to offer. More records coming. Love you guys all. Thank you so much. Like, comment, subscribe, share, all that good stuff. Appreciate you. Have a blessed day, and I will see you again later today with another record that was actually supposed to be today. And then I'll see you again tomorrow. Take care. Bye. Finally doing this episode. Here we go. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, okay, you know what, I'll do a take two, actually.